Uh, while we're waiting for you to be seated, I'll just mention that next week we are meeting in Arnold Conference Room for the final exercise. And uh, I do have an alternate exercise available if you uh, prefer not to come to class next week. Uh, if you uh, would like to do an exercise that involves practicing several different forms of research, uh, see me after class and I'll give you the, the handout on the, uh, the alternate exercise. Um, I'm happy to say that we have a guest speaker today. Uh, I probably disagree with uh, this speaker about as much as anybody in the building on matters of uh, form and style and procedure, but I have seen him really awaken students to the joy of scholarship and to the real pleasure that can be had from doing research and from uh, exercising the mind. And for that reason, I have a lot of respect for this gentleman. I must not be the only one, too, because he has recently been named the TRADOC Instructor of the Year. Um, it's Dr. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Tino Perez. Um, he has a doctorate in pol political science from Indiana, and he's going to talk to you about political science and the profession of arms. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Colonel. Hey, somebody give me a 30-minute time hack. So is it? Oh, I got. I never mind. I got it up there. So, hey, so uh, thanks for having me today. I think today is the day you're turning in your final perspective. So perhaps this is OBE, right? But I also know uh, uh, the, the the journey of the MMAS, and that it's very likely that many of you are going to switch your topic, or at least uh, switch a significant part of your methodology or your question in some way. That's just natural to writing. You seldom finish up with what what you started off with. So with that in mind, I think what we'll, we'll talk about today will still be helpful. If you can, can you move it all the way up to the front? I'd like to have a, a more intimate uh, discussion here. As I'm speaking, please feel free to, uh, to interrupt and to ask a question. Uh, I don't mind. And don't hesitate to ask specific questions about your thesis and how, how what I'm saying uh, affects perhaps what you might be doing with your own, with your own work. All right. So I, I'm first and foremost a military professional. I'm a, a former tanker, now I'm a, a strategist. But I, I also uh, uh, consider myself um, a, a political scientist, a, a practicing scholar. So I still try to, to, to read and to produce, uh, I do research, and try to put, put things out there. And so I love both the military profession because of the persons whom we're charged to, to care for and the dangerous work we're we've been chosen to do. I love the profession, profession of arms. But I think also that the scholarly profession, and specifically the social sciences, and more specifically political science, uh, has a lot to add to how we understand the work that we do as uh, military professionals. And that uh, it's to the point now where if somebody asks me what is military advice, I, I think that too many of my fellow military professionals would say, well, military advice entails simply uh, understanding how to employ uh, weapon systems in order to destroy things or kill people, right? The management of violence, as Sam Samuel Huntington put it. But I think it's much more than that. I think we have to know cold our doctrine, how to integrate the joint functions, how to integrate the war fighting functions, how to think about logistics, how to bring combat power to bear against an enemy. But if we only think in those terms, we're going to fail and the failure is going to show up, I think, in terms of uh, uh, the precious uh, uh, treasure that we have in order to do our business, right? We're going to lose it. And so what I, what I am convinced now is that military advice entails understanding how lethal power combines with non-military factors like politics, governance, economics, culture, identity, languages, sex, tribes, etc., in order to form complex challenges. And if you can't give advice to your commander as an XORS-3 or to the president or national security advisor as a chief or a GCC, if you can't do that without thinking through the second, third order implications of what your lethal actions are going to entail, then, then we're not doing enough thinking about non-military things. So that, that's where I think political science has a lot of value. I appreciate Connie for being up front with the disagreement because I know I am in my classroom, as, as some of you have had me for 211.0. And this is good, right? Because even within political science, within the discipline of history, there are huge debates. Now they don't matter much, right? 
but there are huge debates about what constitutes scholarship. Okay. I'm going to show you, uh, in the same way that I show my 211 students, examples of political science, social science uh, uh, research. And what I'm mainly going to do is flash up on the screen uh, abstracts, you know, the, the, the thing that you're writing you know, for your work as well that, su that summarizes uh, the key points of your work. And in some cases, I'll, I'll summarize a, a portion of the document, uh, the actual document itself. And the purpose is to show you the great variety uh, of, of uh, scholarship that you can do with respect to the questions that are important to us. So first and foremost, how can you bring political science approaches to bear with your MMAS? But second, I'm considering myself an advocate for political science more generally. And once you leave here, how is it that as a military professional, and any civilians in here, uh, national security professionals, how is it that you can bring uh, political science to bear on the questions that we ask after you leave, right? Not necessarily in your research. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, one of the ways that you can, this is basic, right, is to, uh, to, to do research is to start with a theory that's already out there. In C200, I think, you learn three theories about international relations, right? You learn what? What are, the, what are they? Realism, liberalism, and constructivism, right? And a lot of instructors blow off constructivism because it's too hard and you know, don't quite understand it. Not, not that hard, okay, it's important. Three theories. So you take one of them and you test it. You go out someplace you know, in your, a geographic command or where you're going to be regionally aligned or some area of the world where you're interested in, and you test the implications of that theory for that region. Right? Or the other thing you can do is to uh, test an existing theory uh, um, having modified it. So you take realism and you modify it in such a way that it's something new, something you created, and then you test it. Uh, by applying it to a specific case. Let me flash up an example. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, Rosado and Schusler. It's an uh, article from tw uh, 2011, A Realist Foreign Policy for the United States. Okay, now I put the whole abstract up there so you can see several things. One of the things you'll see in almost all of these examples is the use of the first person, right? And this is what Connie and I disagree with. These are the best researchers, the ones getting published right now in the best journals, and you'll see that you see, you see the term we or I. These are the scientists that are giving you the report of what they did. Now, that doesn't mean you can use we and I throughout the report, but it means when you're stating what, what the significance of the paper is, what you're doing, it's okay to use first person. It wasn't about 50 years ago. Now, it's, it's pretty standard. Eight out of 10 articles in any journal will have first person. Okay. This question will be decided by your chair, how it goes. That's, that's uh, what Dr. Bauman has stated. Okay, so what did they do with this theory? Well, they said, look, most people when they talk about the theories, international relations theories, they say that realism is a warmongering theory. It's an aggressive theory. When we talk about it, we teach you about Hobbes, and we, we teach you about the state of anarchy, and we teach you that nations are competing with each other in order to gain more security or to gain more power. All right, and lots of variations. But what these, what these authors do is they look at the existing literature uh, with respect to realism. They stay true to it, but they introduce modifications so that what comes out is a realism that is to be understood as more peaceful. That if you pursue realism the way these authors understand it in terms of a national security strategy, what you'll end up doing is having more peace and you'll fight fewer wars. And most importantly, the outcomes will be more in accord with our national security objectives. So that's what the authors do. They take realism, a well-known theory, people have been talking about it for decades, they change it up a little bit, and then they offer new predictions. And then what they say is they go through and hypothetically argue that if the United States had pursued national security in terms of this re understanding of realism, we could have avoided all of the major wars that we fought and still gotten better outcomes. Now, in some cases, like World War II, it would have meant that nations were intervening much earlier, like in the 30s, and as opposed to waiting in the 40s. It would have, you, had, you would have had to move your aggression earlier. But fewer wars, more peace, and better outcomes. This is a paper that anybody in this room can write, because there are no numbers. There's no statistical analysis in it. There is no econometrics. There is no formal modeling. Okay? If you look at almost any journal of political science today, 
eight out of 10 of the articles as you flip through will involve sophisticated statistical and econometric analysis. Okay. We don't have the luxury of learning two to three years worth of econom economics and econometrics in order to do this kind of analysis. But there is cutting edge political science out there that you can do because there's nothing in here except for cleverness and an ability to go through history and make solid arguments that are historically based, right? Anybody can write this paper. Okay. All right, next slide. Here's another one. Jacobs and Page, who influence, influences a US foreign policy? My students, 211, you've seen this already. I, uh, forgive me. Uh, might be a good refresher. When we think about uh, US foreign policy and national security in this building, we think of it in terms of a very laboratory, sterile, clinical way. We produce national security strategies. These you know, generate national defense strategies, uh, uh, national military strategies, et cetera. It goes all the way down, right? And then that has an effect on budgeting, et cetera. And it's a very clean process. And the idea is that you have people in a presidential administration, the National Security Council of various levels, who are looking out at the world and are prioritizing what it is that we ought to be doing with our resources. And they're making lots of good arguments about this is more important and things like we should rebalance you know, more towards Asia and South Pacific, et cetera. It's too clean. These are highly political documents. And the documents, perhaps, you could argue, don't really matter. What this article is saying, OK, let's, let's look at what's out there. People make different arguments about who influences US foreign policy. Okay. This is a democracy in the United States. Who do you think ought to determine foreign policy in a democracy? What might be the first guess? Yeah. The people and elected leaders responding to those people, right? We, we say, you know, the president has a mandate, and people can question this, but the president has a mandate, and he wants to do this because he's been elected. Well, the people supported him, his election, so he's in. Okay. What's another? All right, some people describe our democracy as being a pluralist democracy. So it comprises interest groups, right? Business, labor interests, et cetera. And they fight it out, like the National Rifle Association and then anti, you know, gun control and pro-gun control, anti-gun control. They'll fight it out. And depending on who wins that war with the US government being the arena, that will determine what the policy is, right? So some, some people say, yeah, democracy is government by the people. But other people say, well, it's actually a uh, 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 pluralism. Our democracy is pluralist, in which you have competing groups. They hash it out, and then the government as the umpire decides, OK, this is going to be the policy. Who else? Okay. Other people say it's something, they use a fancy word, a fancy term, epistemic communities. Not important. Epistemic has to do with knowledge, right? These are all the people in the think tanks, right? Universities, all the pundits, all the foreign policy you know, bloggers, etc., the literati. And some people argue that it's actually epistemic communities because they're, they're in a revolving door. Somebody will be in government, and they'll get out, they'll go teach at a university, and then two or three more years later, they'll go into the, the government again. Petraeus just got out of you know, government service, right? Now he's going to teach at what, New York City, SUNY, City University of New York, and he's got a position at USC. And then probably in three or four years, he'll go back into government in some capacity. And there's a revolving door, right? And it also happens with business, right? But some people say epistemic communities. And what these authors say is that, look, uh, people make arguments that one of these is more important than, and that it has influence. But no one has yet, as far as 2005 is concerned, compared them all in order to discern which one has the most influence. And so they do all this statistical analysis. And what they find is that actually the number one uh, um, generator of foreign policy, the number one influencer, is business interest. Big business, big oil. And that is what influences foreign policy more so than anything else. Second in line, although a distant second, is epistemic communities. And way on down the line is the people. Okay. Now, can you replicate the statistical analysis in this study? Probably not, unless you have the training. And it takes two, three, four years of training in order to do it. But what can you do? You can say, OK, I'm going to examine the, 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 uh, our, our increasing concern in the United States uh, with China. 
And I'm going to find out, as a scholar, as a military professional, what is driving it. And I'm going to go look at congressional archives. I'm going to read what congressmen and senators are saying. I'm going to try to discern who are the lobbyists that they're talking to. And I'm going to try to figure out if, indeed, this theory that business interests drive our foreign policy is also driving our pivot and our increasing attention to China. And you can do that study. It just means you know, rolling up your sleeves and going to the library and asking for resources. Okay. This is something you can do. And it's interesting. And it's scholarly. Next, uh, next slide, please. This is Stathis Kalivas. Okay. If there's a, uh, someone who's at the top of his game right now in the study of civil wars, it's Stathis Kalivas. Actually, if, you, if any of you go to Sam's, you'll read his uh, Logic of Civil War. I think this is the name of his book. It's 2006. But he is... Right now, uh, you know, if Dempsey's at the top of, top of his game militarily, Kalivas is, is at the top of his game in terms of the scholarly approach to uh, uh, civil wars. But he wrote this article back in 2003 in a journal that had just come out because of arguments going into the debate of political science about what constitutes political science. Here, he doesn't use any numbers. This is a study you could do. But what he argues is, look, when we think about wars historically, we say that there is a driving conflict. He calls it a driving uh, cleavage or a master cleavage. And my students always get a kick out of this. And this is terminology. Okay. And what does he mean by that? Well, with any big civil war, you can say it's between the North and the South. Or you can say it's Shia versus Sunni. Or you can say it's Christian versus Muslim. Right? And that's what's driving it. And so when we go uh, deploy to Iraq in 2005, you know, we think it, there's an insurgency, or 2006, there's an insurgency, and there's a competition between the people in the center, the Iraqi government, and then the insurgents on the other side. But then when we get on the ground, we start to realize, wait a minute, like, there's all these people here, and I don't know who the heck they support. It really doesn't matter what their religiosity is, or what their tribe is, or what their identity is. I have no sense of what's going on. And telling me it's an insurgency? as a military professional, isn't helping me. Well, what Kalivas did is he went throughout space and time, exhaustive. It's, it's tiring to read this paper. And he says that if you look at these civil wars, yes, you can identify a driving cleavage that separates two big contending factions like North and South. But why people are fighting actually in local areas, like when we go on our patrols, it goes back to grievances that went back decades to arguments between peoples that went back decades. And they're settling personal scores, private scores, in the name of a political uh, conflict, a war. And this happens time and time again. So it's too simple now, as a military professional, once you've read this, to go deploy and say, you know, we're going to participate in Syria, and here's what's going on, you know, conceivably. Because when we get on the ground, it's going to be very messy, and you're going to be the ones, we're going to be the ones who have to make sense of it. So North versus South, Sunni, Shia, Christian, Muslim doesn't help. We need to know the local dynamics. You can do this paper. So that you can go to any war, or you can take two or three cases, two or three different civil wars, and you can examine it. Not in terms of North versus South, East, West, whatever, but you can actually do research and find out what the lo local dynamics were that were causing the conflict and how they feed off each other. And you can do that paper. Okay, next page. Uh, next slide. The other thing you can do, uh, second thing, is theorize the implications of a, a piece of work or a body of literature for the profession of arms or things that we do like strategy and, and planning. Okay? Because when, in this institution, it privileges historical study. Because there's not any political scientists you know, in, in key positions, and you don't have a political science department that can put this kind of literature in front of you, right? So one of the things you can do in political science is, is and this is what I am as a political theorist, you can theorize things. You can juxtapose contending ideas. And as long as you're using scholarly sources and arguments in the development of your MMAS thesis, you can write a theoretical paper that is Absolutely scholarly. Okay, so next slide, please. So once again, Stathis Kalivas I told you about. Here, uh, he talks about technologies of rebellion. And he says when people think about civil wars, most of, them, most of the time they think in terms of uh, irregular war. 
that there's an asymmetric conflict between a government that has heavy artillery, heavy armor, heavy mechanized infantry going against an irregular force that is forced to use, you know, IEDs and, and basic rifles and machine guns. That's it. But he said that picture of civil war, while still out there, and you know of cases today, it's not the most common one since the end of the Cold War. And he says that there's two other instances of civil war. One is where both the government and the opposing force are using basic arms, you know, non-heavy arms in order to fight each other out. And that's sy symmetrical, non-conventional warfare. And then they argue that there's a third type of war where both the government and the rebels are using heavy weapons, heavy armor, heavy infantry, heavy mechanized uh, 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 forces. And that last type of war is becoming increasingly more prevalent since the end of the Cold War. And this is written in 2010. So then why would you theorize this? Well, think about it. Wither tanks in the US Army. Wither heavy artillery. Wither close air support. What are to become of these heavy weapon systems? If this is right or plausible, we may indeed get involved in civil wars in the future. But it's not the fact that we're going to be fighting irregular threats. We could very well be fighting heavy forces. And that's, that, that has implications for our force mix, for our equipment. Do you see what I'm saying here? Does it make sense? So you could think about, well, what is, what, what is our budgetary, what are our budgetary priorities? What do our uh, forces look like, given that we're reflecting on what's happened since 9-11 in Iraq and Afghanistan, and what arguments like this are portraying, are, are saying about the future? Okay, next slide. Patricia Sullivan, War Aims and War Outcomes. This is, this is a good article. She looked at uh, conflicts throughout history. And, sh and she's asking the question, why is it that powerful states like the US, many others, why is it that powerful states often lose to small, weak, militarily weak states? Because it happens over and over again. And there's lots of arguments out there. And she responds to them in the literature review. And she, she surveys them. But what she, do what she does, she looks throughout history. It, it, it conflicts where you had a, a, a major, strong power against a weak foe. And what she finds is the thing that drives whether the, the strong, uh, uh, the strong uh, uh, military superpower wins or loses is the nature of the objective that it pursues. If the major power pursues an objective that can be achieved with military means, for, an, for instance, the seizure of authority, of territory, I'm sorry, the securing of territory, or say the, uh, the uh, destruction of, an, of a certain force, then more often than not, throughout history, more often, significantly more often than not, the major power is going to win. But when a major power fights a war where the objective in, requires, to some extent, the compliance of a target uh, population, more often than not, and significantly more often than not, the major power is going to lose. And the, then they, these, uh, the authors in this article and others explore the, the mechanisms for why that is. It's not just telling you it happens, but they theorize why it's happening and try to find empirical evidence for it. If that's true, does that have implications for national security, for the kind of wars that we embark on? Not too long ago, I think it was about, it was in March, and uh, Admiral Stavridis was asked uh, uh, by a uh, senator, says, hey, can we uh, use military power to get rid of Assad? He goes, well, sir, you know, the, 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 the countries involved are investigating this question. No, 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 no. I'm asking you, can military power get rid of Assad? Uh, yes, sir, I think it can. OK, next question, next questioner. That was it. There was no you know, uh, questioning about, well, what next? Who do we support? Do we understand the different armed groups that are on the ground? What is our objective? How might it change over time? And if this is true, and you require the, the compliance of some target entity, you're going to send a lot of people you know, to the deaths 
wearing uniforms, and it's not necessarily the case that it's a good idea to start off with in the first place. Do you, do you see? So you can theorize this article and similar ones in terms of, uh, of what we're doing in national security and our force mixture. Next slide. Monica Duffy Toft. Uh, I think here in leadership, you get a pretty big dose of negotiations, right? I think, or you will. Okay. So one of the things that we learn is hey, you need to be a good negotiator. And there's certain techniques that you use uh, for negotiations. And it sounds plausible that if you're going to achieve conflict termination, that you're going to need military professionals uh, working together with unified action partners who are good at negotiations. But this, uh, Monica Duffy Toft, looks at wars from 1940 to 2002, in which she's comparing wars that ended via negotiation and wars that ended uh, via a rebel victory. And if you look beyond the eight to 10 year horizon, those wars that end with negotiated settlement, free, uh, those, those uh, settlements that occur with, through negotiation, frequently break down and what you have is a bloody mess that follows. However, when you have a rebel victory, what you have is more stability, more peace, and in fact, a greater uh, uh, propensity to have a democracy arise that is, to some degree, human rights respecting. Now, what political science does and what history does and good scholars everywhere do is they're always looking for something that's counterintuitive, for something that's hidden. And this is counterintuitive and hidden. If it's true, and by the way, all of this is contestable, you don't take any of this as a truth. You take it as possibilities, as offering connections between things that you wouldn't have considered before. But if this is true, it's pretty significant. It's not always the case. In fact, it's seldom the case that negotiations are going to lead to a good outcome. Yet that's what we teach here in PME. Right? So to theorize this kind of literature in light of what we do as our, uh, uh, military professionals and what we learn and what we, what we try to do is, is of interest. Next. Okay, so uh, this is, this is it helps if you take a shot of tequila you know, before you read this, right? But uh, this is a William Connolly. He's one of the top political theorists out there. Uh, at SAMS, and to some degree in doctrine, we, we, we talk about complexity. Right? Military professors talk about complexity and the importance of understanding complexity in the technical sense and the, the, its, its impact for us. Well, when we think about our operations, and as you're thinking about them now in the course where you're in right now, C400, right? Uh, you're, you're encouraged to think in terms of uh, you know, lines of uh, effort, and you have certain objectives arrayed along here, and each of these uh, uh, lines of effort leads to a certain state on the ground or conditions. So you have something like governance or security or human rights or information operations or whatever. And each of those lines, when those objectives are, are met, will lead to certain conditions on the ground. You add up all of your conditions and you get an end state. Right? And then you come up, you know, the objectives here, you list them all out. Right? Where is the context here? Where is the context in this picture? Where are the local dynamics? Where's governance, politics, economics? Where's what's going on on the ground in Azerbaijan and in Ahuristan and in the greater Gat region? Where is that reflected here? And what the problem becomes is that we're so used to looking in terms of what we do as military professionals and how we're going to intervene in the environment that we fail to understand that it's quite possible that if this is the environment and these are all the dynamics that are going on, in a systems way, the way Connolly is describing him here, where you have all these different economic, governmental, political systems colliding, that when we intervene, it may be this big. And we may, really may not be the driving factor in terms of what happens here, in terms of conflict termination. And that's quite possible. And looking at the world in terms of complexity, 
starts to disturb a lot of what we think about in terms of military interventions. There's a, there's a study. Uh, Douglas Ollivant was a lieutenant colonel and was a G5 planner uh, for uh, uh, First Cav. Political theorist like myself, studied in Indiana, followed him uh, to West Point and then afterwards. He was the chief planner, the, the chief writer for the Baghdad Security Plan. And while he was there, the narrative was that, hey, we have FM 3-24 has just been written. We have General Petraeus that has just uh, taken over at MNFI. And uh, uh, by the way, there's something going on in Ambar, and, and, uh, and we're trying to uh, co-opt the population. The number one thing we're trying to do is no longer build up the security forces because that's not going to happen in time. What we have to do now, number one, change from Casey, is protect the population. And what happens is, somehow, around 2008, 2009, violence drops. It does drop. It becomes, as one author said, a, quote, less shitty place. Still shitty, but less shitty. And people attribute various things, various reasons for why this drop in violence occurred. Some people say it was Petraeus, right? His great military and politically astute leadership. Other people say it was the institutionalization of counterinsurgency via FM 3-24. Uh, right. Other people say it was the proficiency of the troops on the ground doing counterinsurgency that actually worked. Right. Other people say it had nothing to do with that. It had to do with the Ambar Awakening and the spreading of the Sons of Iraq movement. And all these different reasons are given for why the drop in violence occurred. What Doug Ollivant wrote about two years ago in a study, and remember, he was on the scene and w believed in that narrative. What he said, really, what drove the drop in violence, according to him, he's a political scientist as well, according to him, was actually that the Sunni realized that they were about to be decimated. That they, real they had been told for so long that they were actually in the numerical majority, that they were powerful, that in some Aryan sense, sort of an analogous way, that they were superior to the Shia, and then any conflict, they triumph. And then, as Doug Olivan says, war has an interesting way of clarifying information. And they started to realize they're on the losing end. And it was that decision among the Sunni to say, well, who's around who can support us to turn to the United States, the president, President Bush, and the forces for help in order to salvage some sort of uh, 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 a decent outcome for them. What Doug Olivan is saying, actually, it's just things that occur out here, arguably, are more important than the campaign plans that you're starting to write now in C400. Now, is he right? Once again, it's all contestable. Well, what if it's true? What if we really don't control the world through our military interventions the way we think we do and the way you think you will once you actually run a scenario with the GATT region? It's all going to be happy. Right? You're going to bring it to a good conclusion. Why? Because of your lines of effort and your objectives and your conditions and your end state and the great performance of your mythical soldiers and against a Haristan, right? Well, what if the world doesn't work like that? Okay. All right, uh, next. Okay. In political science, and I think in scholarship generally, and especially, and I think history as well, it's very difficult to say something small, albeit important, with proof. Now, you can go on foreign affairs, and write an article there. That's not scholarly. You can go in Time Magazine and write an article there. You can go on foreign policy, a blog or the journal itself, and write an article there and get it published. But that's not scholarship. Those are wide sweeping opinion pieces about the way things are or the way they should be. And this is interesting because I got an email this morning from a colleague uh, where he received a, a, a list of, uh, and I guess something that War College normally does, where someone compiles scholarly readings, you know, that, that we ought to be paying attention to as military professionals. Foreign affairs, foreign affairs, foreign affairs, joint forces quarterly, uh, survival, which actually is, you know, good. Uh, Small Wars Journal, which can be scholarly, but, but oftentimes it's just an opinion piece. There's nothing here like the literature that we're talking about that really rigorously looks at the evidence and tries to prove that something's the case. Okay. So given that state, what you can do is amass some evidence for your arguments and call it, quote, a plausibility probe. You create a theory 
or a hypothesis, and you say, I'm going to look at these three or four or five cases, and I'm going to gather evidence that suggests what I'm talking about in my theory actually is playing out in the real world. And you say up front in your methodology, this is a plausibility probe. This is really useful. This is really useful for the people in this room. This is a plausibility probe. I do not intend for the evidence I amass in chapter 4 to be conclusive about my results, but it is suggestive that my argument is worth developing further and throwing out there for, for other scholars to consider, to put it in, you know, online so that other the students later on can respond to it. And this is very common, and it's something that you should consider because of the, the amount of time you have to really do your work and the fact that it's, it's a perfectly respected uh, practice. You can also proceed inductively from a set of cases, uh, um, and I'm, I'm only going to go into that. So next, next topic. Hey, sir, I've got a question on that one. Yes. Uh, Dr. Lowe, you talked about an exploratory study. What's the difference between an exploratory study then and a plausibility probe? In, in uh, the kind of study that he's talking about, you are testing a, a theory about how things work. You're testing the plausibility or the believability of your explanation of the set of phenomena. Is that correct? That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's and exploratory is kind of an elegant way of saying fishing expedition. You're gathering a wide range of, of uh, impressions to see if you can get the picture or the shape of the phenomenon or the setting that you're exploring. By the way, uh, you can find me anywhere, and I, I'll sit down with you at length, you know, and, and we can talk about these things. If you have questions, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to meet with you. Okay. Let, let me go back to this, uh, uh, the, the previous slide. Uh, previous slide, please. So we've talked about developing a theory, right? Either taking an existing one or, or modifying it, and then you create certain predictions or explanations, and you try to look at specific cases and to see if it plays out. And that's called deduction, scientific deduction. Okay. Another way to proceed in a scholarly fashion is you look at a series of cases, and then from there, you piece together a theory. And that's called induction. Okay? And what Kalivas did is he looked throughout space and time, and he said that, hey, you know, these conflicts, these civil wars, they actually include both a driving cleavage between, at the national level, but they also include a whole bunch of local conflicts, and they feed off each other. Well, from looking at different cases, he was able to develop that theory, and that's induction. It's at this point that you can say, hey, the, the three theories that I'm amassing for my paper uh, constitute a plausibility probe that my theory is worth exploring, that there's something to it. Okay, you can proceed that way. All right, next slide. Thanks. Okay. Um, this is another paper that you could write because there's no num there are no numbers on it. There's just a lot of very difficult thinking and actually a very difficult historical work. I'm not going to go into the details, which you can see there. But what the, what the authors found is that we think about war in terms of a clash of wills. But we think about it in terms of a clash of will to the, till the end, till one, till one side submits to the other. So the idea, when we talk about clash of wills, right, uh, war is a clash of wills, it's our job to cause the enemy to submit to our will. And that's it. And that's, that's success. But what this author finds is looking throughout space and time and, and using this plausibility probe technique, that if you look at two factors, one, when, when, when entities are fighting each other, is, are there front lines between them, or are they intermixed, like an insurgency that we've been involved in? One. And the other one is, is there some variance of cooperation between the, the adversaries, cooperation. And what you find is on the battlefield, in battlefields in the real world, oftentimes the opposing forces, say the government and the rebels, are working together. They're working together either with 
say, drug traffickers in order to both benefit from that money. Or as uh, Stanley McChrystal in his recent book talked about, the, the Taliban issued a card to, I think it was Red Cross workers, Red Crescent workers, whatever, and they were, they were approved by the government, the Afghan government, so to go out there and do polio vaccines. And these, these workers were authorized by both the Taliban and McChrystal, who approved it, and the Karzai government to go out there and administer polio vaccines. But this happens in lots of hidden ways where there's like shady money being handled where the, in, in open ways so that it gets to the point where sometimes in these wars, in the real world, there'll be an army that's going into a, a certain territory. And that army will surrender weapons to the adversary forces, go in, do their business, come back out, get their weapons, it's peaceful, and then the same two groups are fighting each other several miles down the road. And what happens is, if this is the case, and it really, it's empirically true, it opens possibilities for conflict termination. And it depicts war in a different way, as it really exists, where it's not simply the clash of wills till someone submits. Oftentimes, it's messy, and it endures for years and years and years. And we put up with it. Now, we're military professionals. And people are writing things like this to describe our operational environment. And we're not reading it. And we don't know it exists. And it's describing empirically valid, true conditions on the ground. How? Why? Why is that the case? Why aren't we exposed to this and, and, and other similar, similar literatures? But what they're doing here is a plausibility probe. Hey, this thing is occurring all over. I'm just going to point and, and unpack uh, specific e episodes and, uh, and uh, uh, show examples from South Asia, conflicts, that this is really occurring. Okay, next slide. You can also study practices. Uh, I'm, I'm doing research right now where pretty soon I'm going to go into some of your classrooms and I'm going to take notes sitting in the back of the room. Uh, you have to get approved for this, human resources, uh, human subjects. Uh, you know. But I'm sitting in the back of the room. I'm going to watch how you ask and explore certain questions, right, as military professionals going up to the whiteboard and investigating problems. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here's, this is an interesting one. This is, this is good, all right. It's all good. This scholar uh, takes a theory that exists in uh, psychological and, and economics uh, 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 literatures. And what he finds is that when we talk about uh, why did the U.S. Uh, policymakers and, and military planners fail to plan for phase four, you know, it's an interesting question but they apply this theory that exists elsewhere to it. And what they find is, as a psychological, hardwired um, mechanism that all human persons have, irrespective of culture, language, identity, etc., all of us have this tendency. When we talk about short-term objectives, things that are going to occur you know, in, a, in, in a week or two weeks or three weeks or a few months, we're, we're very concerned about unpacking the details of how it's going to happen. So I want to get to, you know, vacation in, you know, California and Disneyland, Disneyland, Disney World, Disneyland in California. And we're going to, that's our objective. And we're, as a family, going to go through all the details of, you know, planning the route, what are we taking, when are we going to get there, how long are we going to stay there, do we have enough money, what are we going to pay for it? We'll work through all the details with respect to feasibility. Can it be done? But when we talk as human beings, psychologically hardwired, about long-term objectives. We stop talking about feasibility and we start talking about desirability. Do you, do you see the difference here? So tomorrow we're going to do a training mission. Uh, your company is going to run a range. And the lieutenant who's just got it you know, put on him, he's going to go through a bunch of, uh, a, a big ordeal and you're going to go through an ordeal checking him on making sure that range is 100% good to go. The objective is the range. All the details. Who are the NCOs? Who's going to have the paddles? Who's going to be up in the tower? Where are the score sheets? What are we going to do? It's all going to be laid out. But if I say I want a stable and secure Afghanistan, we won't evaluate it in terms of the same feasibility criteria. We'll evaluate it in terms of, that sounds good. A liberal democracy, a Jeffersonian democracy. 
And this is hardwired. So the one thing you could do is take this study, and then when you do the GATT scenario, go into a room, not, not your classroom, or maybe your classroom if you get permission, and just kind of sit back. And when you talk about short-term objectives, how do, your how do we talk as military professionals? How do your colleagues talk? And just take notes. And when they start talking about, we want a stable, secure Afghanistan, uh, 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 Azerbaijan, where a Hurstan is south of the border and the border is intact and protected on both, ah, do they talk about desirability or feasibility? Do they make that transition? And you test the theory. That's pretty neat. Nobody's doing work like that, but it's perfectly valid scholarly work. Right. First person, I argue. Ah. Okay, next slide. All right, juxtaposed doctrine or prevalent military understanding with cutting edge literature. Next slide. Okay, uh, when we think about culture, oftentimes we'll go to our AO, say it's right here, and we'll think that good cultural analysis is part of JAPOE or IPB entails, you know, where there's one ethnicity here, another one here, there's this tribe here, this tribe here, and you'll do this kind of thing right here. You, you'll, you'll do some kind of little picture that shows you know, where each of the different ethnicities uh, lives. And the presumption is that there's going to be conflict here and here and here because they don't like each other, because they have fundamentally different beliefs about religion, about tribe, about sect, about whatever. Right? And we say, well, be when there's different opposing ethnicities, different ethnicities juxtaposed next to each other, they're going to fight. And we, we all think this way. And so we'll look at Azerbaijan, we'll divide it up, well, you know, who are, what are the different ethnicities and how do they dislike each other. What we fail to see is that in the real world, and Kalivas is very good at this, that doesn't work, right? It doesn't look like that. And one of the, so this study, you can read the abstract, but he says, you know, Vietnam, if you go back and you, you, you study what was going on, it was rife with ethnic conflict. But well, we don't think about it in terms of, et there were multiple ethnicities in conflict with each other. But well, we don't think of Vietnam that way. We think of it in terms of an ideological war. And there's reasons for that. Okay. And it's not necessarily the case that was, was happening in Iraq at the time he was writing, 2007, that it was simply Shia Sunni. And because there were these differences, that's the reason you had war. Just because you have different ethnicities living next to each other, even if they're in conflict, doesn't mean that you're dealing with an ethnic war, which means how you go about fighting it and how you go thinking about how it should end, it matters. Okay, next, next slide related to the same topic. This one's just out, uh, Cambridge University Press, uh, Fotini Christia. This is the kind of person who should be talking to you in front of you know, Eisenhower. This scholar is looking at actual armed group leaders, tactical leaders on the ground. And she looked at both uh, 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 Bosnia, 1940s, and then uh, early 1990s, and then she looked at Afghanistan before 9-11, you know, you know, when, when there was the uh, 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 violence among the different uh, tribes and people. And then she, using in-depth, oftentimes she interviewed these actual armed group leaders. And then she looked throughout space and time and did more statistical analysis to back up and justify the argumentation. But she says, look, you know, we think that when we look at these conflicts, that we ought to be thinking in terms of uh, language and culture and understanding history. And what she's arguing, none of that matters. Because what happens on the ground in real wars, and this is undeniable, is that people switch their sides. Armed group leaders switch their allegiances as often as over the course of a month, you, you'll switch your pickup basketball team. That's the image, the, the analogy she used. And the, the principal concern has nothing to do with identity or fundamental deep down beliefs, but it has to do with strategic calculations. Am I on the winning side? If I'm not, I'm going to move to the winning side. But then as the war appears to be coming to, a, to some sort of st stable uh, end, and things end now, 
how big is my armed group, how much is my armed group going to benefit given all the other armed groups that are on the winning side? And if that armed group leader says, you know, I'm on the winning side, but it doesn't look like I'm going to benefit much because I'm a mountain power, that armed group leader will switch to the other side. And you see this dynamic happen over and over again in the real world. She's making an argument that our emphasis on culture, deep down beliefs, religion, ideology, doesn't matter. It's an argument. It's contestable. If you really want to know what's going to happen as a tactical leader with that armed group leader at the operational level, tactical level, or even strategic level, get inside their heads and look at this calculation. And more often than not, she argues, uh, you'll be uh, closer to what, uh, what's actually going to happen. That's pretty stunning, given that you know you, you take, I can't remember what your, the culture class is, but supposedly culture drives everything. According to her, not very much. And she's studying armed group leaders that we conceivably could be fighting you know, in, some, in some way. Okay, next. This is a, a quote from a, uh, actually. So this one's saying here that uh, lots of people think of civil wars in terms of uh, uh, greed or grievance. Like, you know, Mayo, you have a people who are unhappy with their conditions and they're going to re revolt and they'll have a certain ideology to justify, you know, a communist uh, insurgency. Or greed, Blood Diamonds, you know, the, this movie, you see, where people are actually fighting for natural resources and uh, drug trafficking and things like this. And this is why they fight. Think of Colombia, you know, as a mixture of both of these, right? Looking at the literature, people say, well, see the greed or grievance. And this is an article in 2009 argues that, well, that you have greed and grievance all over the place, but you don't have rebellions. And why is it? And what this author argues is it's the presence of feasibility or opportunity, structures out there that are opportunity, that it give rebellions an opportunity to succeed. And that strategic calculation will yield whether you have a rebellion or not. I mean, it's a puzzling question, right? You have poverty, destitution all over the world. You don't have rebellion. Why? We should know this, right? multi professional at least uh, talk about it. Next study. Next slide, please. Okay. There's lots, uh, lots of us, military professionals, who are in this habit. There's a civil war or there's a war. What are the grievances of the people? We need to get to the grievances in order to get to the root causes in order to have a negotiated settlement you know, and achieve a conflict termination. You can always do that. Why? Because every armed group is always going to have a, pub, a, a publicity campaign. Every armed group, even if it's criminally oriented, has to justify what it's doing in terms of a grievance story. So the earnest civil affairs officer, soft officer, S3, XO, uh, S2, is going to go out to the operational environment and trace these grievances from place to place. And, and here she'll have a story to put in front of the commander. But it doesn't mean that's why people are really fighting. It doesn't mean that's really the root cause of the conflict. And, and I see too often this grievance. Uh, there was one of, uh, not your classmates, but he was bef a class before, who was really big into relative deprivation theory. And he came to me, hey, sir, I want to apply relative deprivation theory. That's good. But you need to do a literature review. Because relative deprivation theory hasn't been taken seriously like, since, the, since the, uh, the 60s. And lots of people are complicating that argument. It doesn't play out in the real world. Nobody's writing about it. Yes, sir, yes, sir. All right. A couple months later, hey, so what do you got? Oh, sir, relative deprivation and this and that. You didn't do a lit review. You didn't go out to see who else has things to say about your question. Okay. So same thing with this grievance story. Grievances sound good. They sound like they're the root cause of conflict, but often there's other things going on. Next, uh, next slide. Okay, Erica Chenoweth and uh, Maria Steven, Stephen. The, uh, Erica Chenoweth, she's actually online. You can watch her on YouTube. There's different presentations here. It's a, a recent study. She was a big time security studies uh, a scholar. So, you know, K State has a big security studies program. A lot of military professionals go there and, and get a, a master's, PhD. She was a big time, you know, guns, bullets, you know, basics, the kind of stuff that would interest us. But she went to some uh, uh, lectures and was exposed to different literatures. And she ended up uh, learning about nonviolent protest where people go out and in an organized sort of military planning sort of strategic way, 
engage in protests, not showing up for work, protests in the street, uh, peaceful rebellions, etc. Stopping what's going on in society and in government. And she created her own data set. And she found when you compare violent approaches with these nonviolent approaches, the nonviolent approaches more, way more often win out in terms of securing better outcomes. Now, I, I hesitate to say this to you because it sounds so like kumbaya and John Lennon imagine type stuff. But it's a rigorous data set. And the work has been well received. And it's, there's something to it. And you can see the arguments for yourself. You go on YouTube, type in Erica Channel, with you can watch her argument. But it's, it's pretty compelling stuff. But if we're debating whether to send troops in harm's way, because we want to go you know, in, in the gap you know, where, where all this you know, terrorism might arise from and strike you know, the, within the US, and we're debating sending troops in harm's way to do it, or in some way supporting nonviolent protests and rebellion, you know, which is a better option for, for like, our troopers? It's, it's worth looking into. It's sort of worth at least listening to the argument and knowing what the literature and the evidence is. All right, next. Okay. Uh, I'm going to speed it up here. Uh, oftentimes, what you saw here was scholarly literature responding to other literature about the same questions. Frequently, though, you all are interested in things like close air support or joint security operations, right? Or things like within your branch, the future of armor, right? The, the next artillery system. You're interested. And what I used to say when I first got here was, those aren't scholarly questions. Let's not do them. But that's not right. Because another way to do scholarly work is to apply scholarly tools in order to answer those questions. So I'm working with one student now who, who is, uh, she's studying joint security operations. And her argument is that we screw this up, you know, JSOs. Uh, another uh, student is looking at uh, close air support. It's in your class. And, and how the current system, the current doctrine, you know, between the different services, when put in place, yields a close air support system that is suboptimal. Okay, right? A way to do this analysis is to do institutional analysis. Eleanor Ostrom, the third author here, was my uh, uh, teacher at uh, Indiana University. Uh, she was a political scientist, but she won the Nobel Laureate in Economic Science in 2009 for the kind of work that I'm describing here, the institutional analysis and development framework. What do you do? You essentially go into any system whatsoever, like close air support, joint security operations, and you look at the inc incentive structures of each of the players involved. Okay? Think of another student right now in LDW, my LDW class is studying a, a SERP. Does it lead to less violence or not? And how does it lead to all this corruption and you know, a waste? Because we know it does. He looks at the stakeholders involved in the, in the uh, execution of the SERP program in Iraq. Looks at all the arguments that have been written about it. And he finds out what the incentives are for each of those key players. Do the same thing for close air support. Do the same thing for joint, stability oper uh, joint uh, security operations. And what you're looking for are perverse incentive structures that cause rationally thinking people to act rationally but yield bad outcomes. Okay. What's an example of this perverse incentive? Well, in, in Africa, a government decided to pay its army uh, combat pay. You know, sounds familiar? Probably wonder where they got the idea. Well, there were these soldiers who were in barracks in a safe area. They're rational. They want more money. What do they do? Sneak out at night, plant some, bom plant some uh, uh, bombs. They explode later on. And guess what? Now they're in a combat zone. They get more pay. They set it off themselves. These, these kinds of things happen all the time, especially in development aid, especially in things like SERP, especially in security cooperation, especially when training other armies. If you're training that army and you're the one doing all the work when in danger, and you're tra t training Afghan forces, you're not putting them in front, they have the incentive rationally to let you do the hard work. This institution analysis, you know, she won the Nobel laureate for it, very powerful. And you can, uh, uh, the, uh, a student who's a doctor, you want to compare uh, the incentives 
a vet military professional to be a, you know, a military professional on the one hand and a medical professional on the other. What are the incentives we create for that doctor you know, to do one thing or the other? It, this, this institution analysis is powerful for a whole host of questions. Okay, uh, next. Another one is looking at things in terms of uh, causal logics. Okay, so there's different types of uh, arguments you can make about why humans do things. Okay, if a lion comes in through that door, it doesn't matter what my culture is, what language I speak, what religion I am, and it doesn't matter what those things are for you. We're all going to bolt out this door. Okay, that's a structural cause. Okay. If I'm thinking about doing a rebellion and I'm in an archipelago or I'm in mountainous terrain as opposed to flat terrain where I can't, where I can't hide anywhere, more often than not, according to someone like Collier, I'm going to do a rebellion because it's easier. I can fight in this kind of terrain. Right? That's structural logic describing what I'm doing. Institutional. Institutional is what describes what the, the perverse incentives of what those, uh, the African soldiers did you know, planting those bombs near their barracks so they would get combat pay. Ideational, the idea of counterinsurgency that Petraeus introduced, that's what caused us, you know, to do certain things in the Army. Psychological, the notion that we look at near-term objectives in terms of feasibility and long-term object objectives in terms of desirability, that's hardwired into us, that's a psychological cause. According to this, Craig Parsons, there's no other cause of logic out there. Those are the four. If you're gonna describe human action, there's nothing except for those four that you can use. And my students for three sessions now have tested that, and it works out pretty good. So what you could do is come see me, I'll describe you, give you a quick tutorial on this, and you can analyze your topic of whatever it is using uh, causal logics. And it's applying cutting edge 2007 scholarship to your question. Next. Um, Another one, if you want to look at narratives. Right? You all do PEMESI PT, right? Have you done this yet? What will happen is you put P up on the board, and then they say, OK, your P, go write all the political stuff down. All right, you other two, your M, go write all this other stuff down. And you're at whiteboards all around the room. You're trying to come up with what goes under here. And what the problem is, and this is what doctrine tells us to do, is there's no criteria for relevance for how to do that. So I'm in charge of P. I'm in this corner of my room. I open up an encyclopedia, and I look at Azerbaijan political, and it says, I'm making this up, 350 people in the legislature. That's political, but does that matter? Right? Economic, the chief export is this. Well, that's economic, but does it matter to what we got to do at the operational level, at a JTF or, or a JFLIP? No. Well, one thing you can do is you can look at the words that come out of people's mouths. Look at the players involved, the stakeholders. And you can look, and what you'll find, according to Smith, is that they have different types of stories. And they're, all, they're really not separated. They're mixed in together. Did anybody see Gaza, the fight for Israel, where Gershon and Cohen is this general, and he's told to evacuate uh, uh, Gush Katif, uh, 7,000 red? Did you all see that? All right. Um, a good exercise is to go to that and then assign uh, two or three people to each key player in there. And what happens is you'll get the perspectives of the top rabbis in, the, in, in Gush Katif. You'll get the perspective of Gershom McCohen. You'll get the perspective of the two-star general who is above him. You'll get the perspective of the rabbi and his family. Remember in, that, in, that, uh, in, in the room they were finally evacuated? You'll get the uh, perspective of uh, the journalist, of the strategist in the Israeli uh, uh, government who also made comments. And then you piece those together. And what you get are different stories about po uh, politics. Who should be in charge? Different stories about economics. How should our resources be distributed? And this last one, ethically constituted stories. These are the stories that give us the deepest meaning about what be we believe and why we, why we do the things we do. Religions, philosophies, systems of ethics, etc. cetera. When, when, a, when a rabbi says that God told us to settle this land. That's an ethically constitutive story. It's also political. And so to that person, to lose and be separated from that land is just as painful and just as meaningful as being told to separate from his or her wife, from his wife, her spouse, 
her spouse. It's that painful. So if you want to learn what a, a good criterion or a set of criteria to know what to put in each of these different variables, PMSEPT or PMSE at the joint level, look at narratives because the stakeholders who are involved will reveal through these three different types of stories what goes in each of those columns. It's very powerful. And these stories, key leader engagements, intel reports that you collect and, and, and produce, intel reports from hire, scholars, interviews, patrolling, that's where we get that information. And it's real. That's what you do PMSEPT analysis with. And this is the next project for me. Uh, next, William Connolly. Right now we study ethics in the following way. We say, you know, it's deontological, Kantian, or we say it's utilitarian, Bentham or Mill. Uh, we say it's social contract or whatever. Connolly makes the argument, lots of people, billions, most people in the world don't think this way. Most people in the world don't derive their ethics from some theoretical, philosophical, religious base and then figure out what they are. Yet when we learn ethics here in the building, that's exactly what you learn. And if it's not one of those ethical systems, if it's not Kant or Mill or, or Aristotelian virtue theory or whatever, then you're a relativist. And you're a bad guy because a relativist can't say you know, what's right and wrong. Very, very simple, very, very like 1920s, 30s, 40s. There's different ways of thinking about ethics now, and especially in a military profession that takes people of many different beliefs, and we have to form an organization whose members are willing to fight and die for each other. There's perhaps more sophisticated ways about thinking about ethics that we should be thinking about. This is one of them. It also, when you think about complexity the way William Connolly does, how you think about interventions in the operational environment in your AO and in your JOA change because of what you, what you study here. All right, next. Um, I'm not going to go into this. Uh, actually, abductive reasoning. Okay. Give me a moment. We're looking at the AO, right? This is your area. You've just deployed here. You've set foot on the ground. You need to come up with some understanding of what's going on. So this is you. And what invariably you're going to do is trying to come up with some explanation of what's going on in this mess. Because there's P, there's E, there's E, there's S, there's I, there's I, but you can't see it because it's all hidden. And so at some point, you've got to brief your boss, sir, here's what I think is going on, here's what we ought to do. Good luck. So you're faced having to come up with an explanation for what's going on here. That's not deduction, and it's not inductive reasoning. And that's what you learn here. You don't learn about abductive reasoning, which is coming up with an explanation for a very specific case. And it's sad that we don't learn about it because that's what we're in the business of doing. So you can either do abductive reasoning this way, come up with an explanation by the seat of your pants, or you can actually say, okay, well, I'm going to deploy to Africa in a specific area, and I want to find out why the dynamics are occurring the way they are. Well, one way to, to do it is to go back and find out from stakeholders, actually people involved in African politics and war, what is going on and why according to their narratives, political, economic, ethically constitutive. But the other thing you can do is actually go to scholars who give you different theories about why violence is occurring and perhaps how to mitigate it. And you become familiar with all these different arguments so that you can then create better explanations for what's going on here. And when things don't go the way you would predict in your explanation, and they seldom will, you'll at least know what some of the other possibilities are. But if you don't do this, what you're doing is you're sending people in Humvees to go do key leader engagements, to uh, do serve, to do mentor governance, to do uh, presence patrols into a mess that is a command team. You haven't really taken the time to do your homework. So that's abductive reasoning. If you're going, say, regionally aligned unit to Africa 
And there's all this stuff here for free on JSTOR in the Carl Library about why Sub-Saharan Africa works the way it does. And you don't take time to like read that literature and try to come up with some conclusions for where you might be going and why things are happening the way they are. We're not doing our troopers the best, the best service. But this is abductive reasoning. This is what we do as military professionals. And it's something that's only discovered in the early 20th century by Charles Pierce. People didn't write about it before. Okay, next. All right, I encourage you to use scholarly sources, JSTOR. You should all know what JSTOR is. All the journals that I cited today, you can get them on JSTOR. University presses, Chicago, Cambridge, Oxford, Stanford. Go to the best presses. If you're doing something on China, why not go to the best presses and take a look at what their most recent China you know, uh, uh, books are. Uh, Perspectives on Politics It's an example of a journal where scholars are consciously trying to do problem-based uh, research. That is, they're trying to do research that is grounded on real-world problems out there in terms of war, politics, et cetera, and trying to come up and communicate in ways that non-scholars can, can, can appreciate. There's a couple blog sites, Duck of Minerva, funny names, uh, and Political Violence at a Glance. Just Google those. And what you have is top-notch scholars talking about war, civil war, interstate war, et cetera, looking at Syria right now every single day. And they're using scholarly explanations in common sense, jargon-free terms to describe what's going on. Great resources. And by the way, if you look at those two, they'll branch out to other scholars and other blog sites that are very valuable. It's a big thing now that didn't exist about five years ago. And then arguing the OE, I have my own YouTube channel, have eight episodes, and I've created it in the past three weeks. And the intent is every week to have a short five to 10 minute episode uh, accessible to everybody, faculty, students, other PME institutions and in in forces in the field in order to talk about some of the things we did, albeit less rapid fire and a little bit more developed, but in short segments. Uh, if you've ever seen mobilitywad.com, the CrossFit guy, it's the same sort of informality that we're trying to apply there in, in Arguing the OE. But I encourage you to go to YouTube, look up Arguing the OE. You won't find it by looking at my name. I designed it that way. It's Arguing the OE, and, and uh, you'll see. Uh, there's five episodes on design that for some reason the faculty as a whole aren't sharing with the students, and I don't know why, because it shows how McChrystal used design or elements of it. Lieutenant Colonel Richardson, who's now 3rd ACR commander, how he used design in Iraq in 2008 9 and General Rodriguez, who was a commander at the operational level in Afghanistan, now commander of AFRICOM, how he used design systems thinking. I don't know why we're not sharing that with you as a, as a, as a faculty, but uh, look it up, and I think it'll be good. It's, it, it jives with what we're trying to do here. All right, final thought. I think that we are breathing with one lung. History has a department here. At West Point, you have two departments that look at politics and war, social sciences and uh, the history department. Here we only have one lung. We only have one of those departments. And we're missing out. I've hoped to have convinced you that there's a lot of stuff out there that's very more worthwhile. If you're critical or skeptical, uh, share with me now, and, and we, can, we can have this conversation. Otherwise, I'm just blowing in the wind. Yeah. Well, questions, comments, critiques? And feel free to see me about your paper. I'll open it up. None? All right, cool. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Connie.